Hey folks, this is Pastor Carl Gallops. This particular teaching involves only the biblically and historically potential dates for the conception and or the birth of Jesus. While there's apparently no way to discern the exact date of the birth of Jesus, and I don't know that that's even important to discern, but the Bible does give an actual formula for getting very close to two distinct possibilities. And as I teach this, you'll understand why there's two distinct possibilities. But the formula that's in the scriptures happens to set both of those possibilities for the conception and or the birth during the biblical feast day. You'll see what I mean in just a moment. First, before we start using this formula, uh, let me just state that it is a historical truth that as early as the 200s AD, uh, the date of the birth of Jesus was, was a huge subject of great interest among several of the early church scholars. That's in the 200s. So we have records of these discussions and writings from the writings of Clement of Alexander, and he wrote that there were various days corresponding with uh, what would be our April, various days in April, various days in May, various days in August that were suggested by the scholars of his day in the 200s. And then in another writing of his time, in in several other writings of his time, the day of May the 20th, April 18th, April 19th, March the 25th, January the 2nd, November the 17th, and November the 20th are all suggested in writing in the 200s AD. But there are a couple of writers who wrote about December the 25th, and these were in the 100s AD. Theophilus of Caesarea, uh, who was born in 115 AD, he wrote, quote, we ought to celebrate the birthday of our Lord on what day soever the 25th of December shall happen. That was in the 100s AD. Now, the very earliest source that we have comes, again, in the 100s AD that states December 25th is the birth date of Jesus, and that was from Hippolytus of Rome. He also wrote, quote, For the first advent of our Lord in the flesh, when he was born in Bethlehem, was December the 25th on a Wednesday, while Augustus was in his 42nd year as emperor. And again, that comes from Hippolytus of Rome, and it comes from his book titled Commentary on the Book of Daniel. It was written in the 100s A.D., but as I said at the beginning, there is a formula in the Bible, in Luke chapter 1, that seems to be the most promising for getting close to some kind of a date that would deal with both the conception of Jesus as well as the birth. Now, of course, we want to start the formula using the Jewish ecclesiastical calendar, based largely upon the lunar cycles and the command of Exodus 12 that the first month of the Jewish ecclesiastical year should begin at Passover, which falls in our March and April. But with those Jewish calendar dates in mind, and I will explain them as we go along to keep this simple, but we're going to correspond all of that to our Gregorian calendar dates dates so that it's a whole lot easier to follow. You'll understand as we move along. So I'll speak in ma mainly Gregorian calendar dates. But the bottom line is this. The dates of Passover, as given in Exodus 12, the 10th of Nisan, you choose the lamb, the 14th, you slay the lamb, etc. And this is to be the first month of the new year for you. That's the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. That's all found in Exodus 12. But that date of Passover, of course, on the Gregorian calendar, falls anywhere from the 21st of March to the 25th of April. And that's, of course, because that uh, the Jewish calendar is based upon the lunar cycles more so than the solar cycles like the Gregorian calendar. But the bottom line is that would be the first, the beginning of the ecclesiastical year for the Jews, the beginning of the sacrifices, the beginning of the feast days given by the Lord, the beginning of the Jewish calendar would fall on our between 21st of March or 25th of April, depending upon the lunar cycles for any given year. Now, most of you already know that. Now, where's the formula? It's found in Luke chapter 1, and it is as simple as this. 
In Luke chapter 1, we discover the man by the name of Zechariah, who, of course, will be the father of John the Baptist, his wife being Elizabeth. It's all right there in Luke 1. You know about that. And it says in Luke 1 that Zechariah was in the temple uh, fulfilling his priestly duties. He was a part of a priestly division, and he was of the division of Abijah. And he was serving in the course of Abijah. Luke chapter 1 actually says that when he has the vision from the angel speaking of the fact that his barren wife will be with child and the child will be named John. And of course, that would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist. So all of that is in Luke chapter 1 in the first five or six verses. And we discover there, though, the important thing is, is that it tells us Zechariah was fulfilling the course of Abijah. We find all of the courses listed, or all of the divisions listed in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. The course of Abijah is the eighth course, and each course was to last one week. So, that means Zechariah was serving in the temple for a one-week period during the eighth course. He was in the eighth division of Abijah. Now, the first course would have begun the week of Passover. So, here's what we can discern. So, if um, Passover fell in late April, as it so often does, or it could have fallen a few weeks earlier in late March, but if it fell in any time in late April, then eight weeks later would put the course of Abijah in the temple. That would have put Zechariah in the temple in some time in late June. And then, of course, he would be going home to his wife when she conceives, when he finishes his one-week course. But again, even if he was serving during an earlier week before late April, it's still entirely possible that she would not have actually conceived until sometime in mid or late June as well. So the bottom line is, Zechariah is serving in the eighth course. That's eight weeks after Passover. By our calendar, that would then put him in the temple somewhere in mid to late June, then going home to his wife and her conceiving. Now, as we get into Luke chapter 1 around verse 26, it tells us that the angel came to Mary and she conceived in Elizabeth's sixth month of pregnancy with John the Baptist. So now we're beginning to develop a formula. So we know then that Zechariah and and his wife, Elizabeth, conceived somewhere in late June. So six months later, when Mary conceives and goes to visit Elizabeth in her sixth month, puts her visiting Elizabeth in late December. And depending upon exactly when Passover was and exactly when the conception took place, it's quite possible that Mary conceived on or about December the 25th. This would also align, of course, with the Feast of Hanukkah, an eight-day feast in which we find in John chapter 10, chapter 10, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem, into the temple area, and there he literally claimed to be God in the flesh. You can read John chapter 10. The Pharisees picked up stones to stone him, and when he asked, why are you going to stone me? They said, we are stoning you because you, a mere man, are claiming to be God. You see, even his enemies knew what he was doing. When did Jesus do this? At Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication. It's right there in John chapter 10. It was an eight-day feast. But just a few days before, or maybe the day before, in in John chapter 9, we find Jesus opening the eyes of the blind man in Jerusalem before he would go up to the Feast of Hanukkah at the temple, and there he's claiming to be the light of the world. Well, what's Hanukkah all about? It's about God being with Man, God being with his people in the temple, in the light of the temple, that God's light through the, the, the cleansing of the temple that occurred during the Greek captivity and the Maccabean revolt, the eight-day burning of the lights to cleanse the temple and the presence of God among God's people. That's what the whole Feast of Dedication is about. And during that time in John chapter 10, Jesus went up And it even says it was winter. Of course it was. It would have been late December, roughly equivalent to our December the 25th. 
That would put the birth of Yeshua nine months from then, which would have put Jesus' birth in mid to late September of the next year. That would then put his birth, more than likely, during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the time when God's people celebrate God dwelling with man, a perfect picture of the birth of Jesus Christ. We can easily come up with the conception of Yeshua around December 25th and the birth of Yeshua late in September of the next year, putting his birth right about the Feast of Tabernacles. Beautiful, beautiful biblical pictures using the formula that's in Luke chapter 1. Now, I said there was a second possibility, and it's as simple as this. We know from the scriptures that each of those priestly divisions were required to serve two courses each year. So, if Zechariah's course, of course, was Abijah, and it was in the eighth week after Passover, then the next course would be 24 weeks after that first course, which would then have put Zechariah back in the temple again during late November to late December, again, depending upon the lunar cycles. Six months later from that time would be late May to middle June, right about the time of the Feast of Pentecost when Jesus would have been conceived. That's interesting because the Feast of Pentecost is when we celebrate the conception of the church. It's also when Orthodox Jews to this very day celebrate the conception of the nation of Israel as the law was given at Mount Sinai. They say by tradition that that happened on what would now correspond with Pentecost. So think of the biblical ramifications of that. What if Yeshua was literally conceived at Pentecost, the same time that would later prove to be the day of conception of the church, his body, which going back in history also might prove to be the day when Israel was conceived at Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. Now, his conception then, counting down from there, nine months later, his birth would be during late March or late April. And what does that correspond with? It corresponds with Passover, Jesus, the Lamb of God. So if Zechariah was in his second course, He would have been conceived at Pentecost and then born during Passover. So the bottom line is, taking that formula of Zechariah, serving in the course of Abijah, if he was serving the first course, that puts the conception in late December and the birth in late September, both aligning with feast days that are extremely important in the scriptures. If he was in the second course, His conception would have been at Pentecost, and his birth would have been at Passover. The formula is there. We're not allowed, apparently, to know an exact date of conception or an exact date of the birth. And it's not really important for our salvation. But it is important to understand that from Genesis to Revelation, the entire message of God's word is to celebrate the fact that God kept his promise. From the womb of the woman would come the seed that would crush the head of the serpent, Satan. From the womb of the woman, as Paul said in Galatians 4.4, at just the right time, God did send forth his son from the womb of a woman to deliver us from our sin. That's the celebration of God's word, and that should be the celebration of our hearts all year long and every single day. And that's the biblical truth and the historical truth. I pray that this has served to enlighten you, to encourage you, and to inspire you. May you have a Jesus-filled Christmas. God bless you.